In the year 1800, there were about 7,000 Jewish Palestinians in the whole of Palestine, compared to about 246,000 Muslims and 22,000 Christians. By 1880, the Jewish population had grown to about 24,000. By 1903, 50,000, about 95,000 in 1924. And by 1930, around 160,000 Jewish settlers in Palestine. Almost all of them were Zionists from Europe who had no intention of integration, but rather segregation, buying what land they could in the wake of the Ottoman Empire's collapse, and then expelling Palestinians from it and refusing to allow them to work. This imposed economic hardship is largely what drove the Arab uprising in 1929, which is not my conclusion, but the conclusion of the British Hope Simpson inquiry submitted in October of 1930, which called the uprising an inevitable result of the racist Zionist policies towards Palestinians. In other words, in just a handful of decades, over 100,000 European Zionist settlers backed by rich financiers and the British Empire moved to Palestine, kicked the Arabs off their land, and implemented racist policies that refused to allow them to work, meaning Palestinians were unable to earn money or provide for their families which I just need to point out violates that pesky little bit in the Balfour Declaration that stipulated that non-Jewish communities in Palestine must have their rights protected. All of which paints a very different picture from the common Zionist narrative that the Arabs just attacked us because they're anti-Semitic and for no other reason, a lie which you will hear repeated over and over throughout the propaganda. As a result of the findings of the Hope Simpson inquiry, the Passfield White Paper is issued, which greatly restricted Jewish immigration policies. This results in an enormous uproar from European Jewish organizations, and as a result of that outcry, essentially a retraction of the Passfield Paper is issued in February of 1931 in Arabic called the Black Letter, which well-connected Zionist Chaim Weizmann eventually admits he himself helped write. Now, if you'll remember, a primary antagonizing factor in the 1929 uprising was Betar's threatening demonstrations in Jerusalem. Betar being the fascist-leaning far-right extremist youth group headed by revisionist Zionist Zev Jabotinsky. In the fallout of the 1929 uprising, the Hope Simpson inquiry, the Shaw Commission, and the scare of the Passfield White Paper, the first major militant offshoot of the Haganah is formed, the Ergun, who declares their enemy not just the Palestinian Arabs, but the British as well. And the group is formed by none other than Jabotinsky, and you guessed it, most of its original members were from the Betar Youth Organization. The 1930s are a very dense time in Palestine. There's riots in October 1933 after the British opened fire on peaceful anti-Zionist demonstrations in multiple cities, but particularly in Jaffa. And there's a major uprising, usually called the Great Arab Revolt, that starts in 1936 and lasts for several years. Which, of course, the Arabs started just because they're anti-Semitic and for no other reason whatsoever. Not only are tensions and militancy and extremism on the rise in Palestine, the same is true for the rest of the world, particularly in Europe where fascism is on the rise. This, of course, leads to the rise of the lantern flies in Germany in 1933, which is what I'm calling them for the purposes of this post because of censorship on TikTok and because the colors kind of match and because, like a fascist, there's only one way to deal with the lantern flag. The global Jewish community quickly calls for a boycott of German products, which the mainstream Zionist movement almost immediately ignores. Instead, they negotiate the Havara or transfer agreement with the lantern flies within months and continue to support it for the remainder of the 1930s. And according to multiple sources I've read, this was not just some small agreement, but one of the main reasons the boycott of German goods wasn't more successful. Not only did the Zionist movement oppose the boycott of German goods, they also actively worked against saving Jewish people if saving them resulted in them not being transferred to Palestine. This Reprehensible behavior turns up in multiple incarnations, but is perhaps best summed up by David Ben-Gurion, first Israeli Prime Minister himself, in a speech he gave shortly after the Kristallnacht, which occurred in Germany, a massive pogrom against Jewish people, on November 9th, 1938. As a response to the Kristallnacht, the British undertook an emergency evacuation of Jewish children from Germany, which they called Kinder Transport, which Ben-Gurion hated. And on December 9th, a month later, after the pogrom, he gave a speech in which he said, angrily, 
If I knew that it would be possible to save all the children in Germany by bringing them over to England and only half of them by transporting them to Eretz Israel, then I would opt for the second alternative. For we must weigh not only the life of these children, but also the history of the people of Israel. The British Empire more or less retracts the Balfour Declaration in a white paper in May 1939, but unfortunately, Germany invades Poland about four months later and the Brits become somewhat distracted. To their credit, the Haganah and Irgun both more or less suspend aggression towards the British during World War II, but that upsets a Zionist extremist named Abraham Stern, who again breaks away and forms his own militia called Leahy, also called the Stern Gang. He reaches out to the lantern flies in Europe multiple times trying to establish an alliance because as far as he's concerned, the enemy of his enemy was his friend. He is, of course, mostly ignored. 1939 to 1945 is the deadliest six-year period in human history. The world is completely broken down and remade. And among the many injustices found in the wake of World War II is the severe punishment of Palestinians for crimes they had nothing to do with. Ben-Gurion makes secret deals to acquire munitions in the incoming attacks on Palestinian villages and various European Zionists help orchestrate the UN partition plan, which is a complete disaster. The fledgling committee known as the United Nations draws three barely connected regions with no coastline and hardly any fertile land for the Arabs who immediately reject it. By now, the Jewish population of Palestine numbers somewhere in the vicinity of 630,000, by now mostly via illegal immigration. Just a few weeks after the UN partition is announced in November, in December 1947, the Zionist forces initiate a Nakba, the catastrophe, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. This is, of course, a full half a year before the end of the British mandate in May 1948. As a matter of fact, by May, over 200 Palestinian towns and villages have already been ethnically cleansed via one method or the other, shooting over their heads, barrel bombs, summary execution, mass murder, and SA. Somewhere between 250 and 350,000 Palestinians have already been displaced, all before May 1948. And the British, by this point, tired from the war, are more or less happy to just sit back and watch it happen. By 1949, the Zionists are now a population of around 1 million settlers in Palestine. They have committed more than 70 massacres. Between 750,000 and 1 million Palestinians have been displaced. Zionist forces have seized 78% of Palestine, ethnically cleansed around 530 cities and villages, and killed about 15,000 Palestinians. On December 11th, 1949, the UN passes Resolution 194, calling for the return of Palestinian refugees and compensation, setting a precedent that lasts to this day, the Zionists completely ignore it. It does not take long for the horrors of fascist Germany to work its way into the Western psyche as the ultimate evil, a horror so great it takes on a mythological tone existing outside of time and place and indeed any form of nuanced discussion outside of deliberate re-traumatization. The Zionists are quick to capitalize on this formula to shield themselves from any form of critique while simultaneously looking down on Holocaust survivors with intense disdain. And while every atrocity is unique, they are always part of a progression of tried and true methods of oppression of marginalized people everywhere from indigenous Turtle Islanders to the Atlantic and Indian slave trades to Leopold's Congo. And only by discussing these events in context with radical nuance can we ensure they never happen again. I'm Paul Nabil, Syrian American, and that was the end of the timeline segment of Start Here and the last one I'm uploading in full to TikTok in vertical format because from now on, I'm putting them over on the long form triangle app where I can speak more plainly. So go follow me over there if you want to see the rest of the series. Thanks.